Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone to the second uh, session of the Reading Circle with the Yasmin Mujahid um, Love. And this week's, this week's segment will be about Love F1. Um, just to recap from last week, we spoke about detachment and detaching from the dunya and figuring out where exactly your place with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how to detach and attach. And sometimes in love, we also have this feeling of attachment. And sometimes you, we can question, is there even love without any attachment at all? And this is why we move on this week. And it's also said that and a believer's heart is his guide. And with this, is how we try to navigate and figure out how do we use this love in order to construct, you know, relationships and whatever relationships it may be that we have to do it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also just a reminder that if anyone wants to download the PDF or purchase the book, we have sent all the information on the WhatsApp group. And this can be accessed through the email where a link was sent. We will also be joined by Sister Taslima Ali and Sister Suraya Roika as well, who will be the reflector and the narrator respectively. So we will start, inshallah, with the reader or the narrator, which will be um, Sister Suraya Roika, inshallah. Shukran Muslima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. Welcome once again to the second se session of our reading circle. And as mentioned by Muslima, the chapter we will be reading from tonight is called Love. The subsection is titled Escaping the Worst Prison. When Sarah met Ahmed, she immediately knew he was everything she had always dreamed of. Meeting him was like watching the sun rise in the middle of a snowstorm. His warmth melted the cold. Soon, however, admiration turned to worship. Before she could understand what had happened, Sarah had become a prisoner. The pain of existing without him was unbearable because there was no happiness outside of being with him. He became to her like the blood in her veins. Sarah thought she was in love. Sarah had been through a lot in her life. Her father walked out on her when she was a teenager. She ran away from home when she was 16 and she battled drug and alcohol addictions. She even spent time in jail. The agony of Sarah's worship of Ahmed 
was more intense than the agony of all her previous hardships. It consumed her, but it never fooled her. Like a parched man in the middle of a desert, Sarah was desperately pursuing a mirage. As human beings, we are created with a particular nature or fitra. That fitra is to recognize the oneness of God and to actualize this truth in our lives. Therefore, there is no calamity, no loss, no thing that will cause more pain than putting something equal to God in our lives or our hearts. Shirk on any level breaks the human spirit, now like no worldly tragedy could. If having a child or a particular person in our life is our reason for being, something is terribly wrong. If something finite, temporary and fading becomes the center of our life, the reason for our existence, we will surely break. The imperfect objects that we place at our center will, by definition, fade, let us down or pass away. And our break will occur as soon as it does. What happens if while climbing a mountain, you hang onto a twig to hold all your weight? Laws of physics tell us that the twig, which was never created to carry such a weight, will break. Laws of gravity tell us that it is then that you will most certainly fall. This is not a theory. It is a certainty of the physical world. This reality is also a certainty of the spiritual world. And we are told of this truth in the Quran. Allah says, People, here is an illustration, so listen carefully. Those you call on beside God could not, even if they combined all their forces, create a fly. And if a fly took something away from them, they would not be able to retrieve it. How feeble are the petitioners and how feeble are those they petition? Quran 22, 73. The message of this ayah or verse is deeply profound. Every time you run after, seek or petition something weak or feeble, which by definition is everything other than Allah, you too become weak or feeble. You will soon need to seek something else. You will never reach true contentment or satisfaction. However, there is a freedom from that slavery. When the object upon which you place all your weight is unshaking, unbreakable and unending, you cannot fall, you cannot break. When what you hold onto is strong, you too become strong. And with that strength comes the truest freedom. The experience of Prophet Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam, may Allah send his peace and blessings upon him, is so crucial to internalize. When he was trapped in the belly of the well, he had only one way out, turning completely to Allah, realizing Allah's oneness and his own human frailty. His dua encapsulates this truth in such a profound way. There is no God but you. Glory be to you. I was wrong. Quran 2187. Many of us are also in, trapped inside the belly of a whale of our own desires and objects of worship. It is our own selves which we become enslaved to, and that imprisonment is the result of putting anything where only God should be in our hearts. In doing so, we create the worst and most painful of prisons, because while a worldly prison can only take away what is temporary and inherently imperfect, this spiritual prison takes away what is ultimate, unending, and perfect. Allah and our relationship within. Shukran Muslima. That brings us to the end of the first section of the chapter that we have started to read. Shukran, Sister Sudaya. And it's very really beautiful how she mentioned um, the balance and how our desires come in. And sometimes we seem to love the people with so much that uh, the people around us with so much that we often forget, you know, this person is from our final ta'ala. And that's where all the love and all the people in your life comes from. And just to reflect on this and give us more information on this, it will be Sister Taslima. 
You may go ahead, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi Shrah Li Sadri Wa Yasir Li Amri Wa Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, beloved. I pray that you are all doing well, that you are keeping safe, that your loved ones are keeping safe, and that we've come to this evening with our open hearts, really wanting to seek our best purpose. I think this being our second week, in no doubt, many that have read the Reclaim Your Heart and those that have read it for the second, third, and fourth time. And for us that are now journeying with you on this, you cannot but fall in love with its purpose, which is meant to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about escaping the worst prison and we think of prison itself, it means and it reflects upon a punishment, a punishment of going astray and being taken away into a system that is really, really painful. It takes you away from what is normal. It takes you away from what would be normal life. And when you think of the worst prison, and if you think of the worst prisons of the world, it is just brutal brutal torture. And so in this book with Yasmin uh, Mujahid, with Ustada Yasmin Mujahid, one is openly being drawn into the understanding that our very hearts, our very life, the choices we make could possibly be placing us in that prison. And to be able to know that one really needs to firstly identify what that prisons are and what the prisons we are finding ourselves in. So in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember when your Lord extracted from the loins of Adam's children, their descendants and made them testify saying, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we testify to it. This was in the case you say on the day of judgment, we were unaware of this. Or you say it was our ancestors who worshipped others besides God, and we are only their descendants. Will you then destroy us for what those liars did? Now, when we hear that, it is apparent that our very souls, our roots, already were formed and already submitted to the oneness of Allah. Being born into this world, we then journey into finding our true purpose of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if we were to take that very self that, that, that um, enters um, the actual um, uh, fetus, one needs to realize that we already believe in the oneness of Allah. We already know our creator and we already love our creator. And when we are born, in all innocence, if we were left like that, potentially, potentially, our love for Allah would have grown into that oneness and we could possibly have lived our very purpose, which is to worship him. But as we know, children pick up on the environments. We pick up on where we are. And it is in our primary socialization that we are introduced into loving Allah and loving Allah deeply. But think about a child in all its innocence. When we are introduced in this world, you see different forms of love. Kids are happy and they want to love and they want to know and they love in all innocence. But they pick up on environments to love other people, to love things. We give them toys, we give them positions make them understand if you are good, you get this. If you love mommy or if you love daddy, this is happening. And the conditioning starts from there. And that is why potentially from the time that we are kids to when we reach adulthood, Allah does not keep us responsible for our actions. And so for our mommies and our daddies that are on the platform today, perhaps that is something to reflect on. How are we introducing our children? What environment are we keeping them around to invite a proper purpose and for them to deliver upon it? 
And when we are adults, we then grow into needing to find the proper knowledge and understanding of that to do essence of loving Allah and to truly loving Allah. But because we are so accustomed to needing something to love, and it is very human to love, we tend to find things to fill that gap. And before you know it, we love so much. And we, when those things no longer are for us, when they perish or pass on or leave us, what happens? We break. When it no longer reflects the love that we understand to be love, what happens? We break. And Yasmin, in her earlier chapters, as we did last week, identifies that to also mean that 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 causes you that pain is one of the keys to identifying what should not be in your heart. And so very clearly, Allah loves us and Allah loves us so deeply. But we also need to understand that loving our husbands or loving our wives, loving our family, loving the things we have, even the work that we do, is not forbidden. It's not forbidden in the Holy Quran. We are told to love. We are told to be kind. We are told to be generous. But ultimately, what should be centered in our hearts is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so today, when we journey through these chapters, we are going to establish what exactly in our lives is causing that much of trauma and pain. What exactly in your life is that prison? And so that we can start weaning ourselves and placing it in its proper place. And what do we do in turn? We have to then take Allah and place Allah where Allah should be. And that is in the center of our hearts. And so today's insights and reflections are going to be really, really short because we are needing to dig through a few chapters. But at this point in time, I do think from last week to this week, if we don't also do a little bit of homework and look back into our very hearts and our lives and try and identify things that are actually causing us pain, that are taking us away from our proper purpose, then it's going to be a waste of time actually listening to how to reclaim your heart. Because to reclaim your heart, we're going to have to be active in reclaiming our hearts. And so perhaps it would be good to keep a pen on the side and to ask yourself certain questions as Sister today is reading and as perhaps I am talking, because just like you, we are learning, just like you, we are developing on this journey. But indeed, Allah has created us to worship him and Allah has created us with love. And many a times when we um think, okay, I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to start wearing hijab. I'm going to um, fulfill my, the five pillars of Islam. We tend to define ourselves as good Muslims. But you, 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 there's a greater depth to loving Allah. It's not just about making that hajj tick a box, making salah tick a box. It's about loving Allah. And so if you're going to be making your salah, if you're not particularly um, going and performing a, a, a proper role to be in his company, if you're not yearning from your heart and watching that time to say, you know what, it's Fajr or it's Dhar, and wanting to sit in his company and taking your time, these are the things about cleaning up and identifying true love and identifying the, the things that we can do to reclaim our hearts and reclaim ourselves into the true purpose, inshallah. Shukran, Taslima. And I think what we can take from that, uh, two very important things is to do introspection and also find out what it is that we have in our hearts and what we want in our hearts in order to start somewhere. So we will now move on to the next reading piece for Sister Turaya. Shukran to uh, Muslima. The second subtitle is called, Is This Love That I'm Feeling? Love is a serious mental disease. At least that's how Plato put it. And while anyone who's ever been in love might see some truth to this statement, there is a critical mistake made here. Love is not a mental disease, desire is. 
if being in love means our lives are in pieces and we are completely broken, miserable, utterly consumed, hardly able to function and willing to sacrifice everything, chances are it's not love. Despite what we are taught in popular culture, true love is not supposed to make us like drug addicts. That type of all-consuming obsession is not love. It goes by a different name. It is Hawa, the word used in the Quran to refer to one's lower vain desires and lusts. Allah describes the people who blindly follow these desires as those who are most astray. But if they answer you not, they know that they only follow their own lusts. And who is more astray than the ones who follow his own lusts without guidance from Allah? Quran 2850. By choosing to submit to our hawa over the guidance of Allah, we are choosing to worship those desires. When our love for what we crave is stronger than our love for Allah, we have taken that which we crave as a Lord. If our love for something makes us willing to give up our family, our dignity, our self-respect, our bodies and our sanity, our peace of mind, our deen and even our Lord who created us from nothing, know that we are not in love. We are slaves. Imagine the severity. To have one's sight, hearing and heart all sealed. Hawa is not pleasure. It is a prison. It is a slavery of the mind, body and soul. It is an addiction and a worship. Beautiful examples of this reality can be found throughout literature. In Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, Pip exemplifies this point. In describing his obsession with Estella, he says, I knew to my sorrow often and often, if not always, that I loved her against reason, against promise, against peace, against hope, against happiness, against all discouragement that could be. Dickens's Miss Havisham describes this further. I'll tell you what real love is. It is blind devotion, unquestioning self-humiliation, utter submission, trust and belief against yourself and against the whole world, giving up your whole heart and soul to the smiter, as I did. What Miss Havisham described here is in fact real but it is not real love. It is Hawa. Real love as Allah intended it is not a sickness or an addiction. It is an affection and mercy. Allah says in his book, and of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, that are signs for a people who give thought. Quran 30, 21. Real love brings about calm, not inner torment. True love allows you to be at peace with yourself and with God. That is why Allah says that you may dwell in tranquility. Hawa is the opposite. And though you submit your whole self to it, it will never bring you happiness. So while ultimate happiness is everyone's goal, it is often difficult to see past the illusions and discern love from Hawa. True or pure love should never contradict or compete with one's love for Allah. It should strengthen it. Only by struggling against false pleasure can we attain true pleasure. They are by definition mutually exclusive. For that reason, the struggle against our desires is a prerequisite for the attainment of paradise. Allah says, But as for he who feared the position of his Lord and prevented the soul from unlawful inclination, then in ten, indeed paradise will be his refuge. Quran 79, 40, 41. Shukran Muslima, that brings us to the end of the second reading session. Shukran, Sister Sereya. We will now move on to the reflection with Sister Taslima.
Okay, so is this love that I'm feeling? I think for the longest time, whether you're a young girl or whether you're a young lady, or even for our brothers, I'm sure, there's an understanding of what love is. And it makes me actually think of one of these causes that was hosted by Sister um, Roshan Misbah, and it is um, your love language. And I'm not sure if anybody uh, ha does know about the love languages, but apparently we each have our own love language. That means I, uh, you know, we, we read and we understand a certain action to be love for us. So some people might identify it with affectionate words, others might uh, find it in terms of things done, but there's five different love languages. And what quite happens um, when, especially for couples, is that sometimes we speak different languages and very similarly in other relationships as well. And so sometimes how often would you hear um, a woman say, you know what, he doesn't really love me. But the greatest possibility is that he does love you, but in his love language. And very similarly, frustrations with the brother is that there's a difference in the love languages. But when we listen to Sister um, Mustada Yasmin on, is this love that I'm feeling? It makes me really think about the many different ways that we seek for love. And we do genuinely seek for the perfection in love and to feel love and to really be soaked in it on a daily basis. And in reality, that isn't always possible. But in our truest purpose, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to center Allah in our, in our hearts, be it with our children, be it with our spouses, be it in whatever we find ourselves in. And as we mentioned earlier on, we are instructed to still love each other and have mercy. And we see throughout the Holy Quran that Allah does instruct that he has created us to worship him. And so it had me thinking, so for those of us that are married, when you have those issues, you know, with your spouse, and now and then a little argument or other issues, one tends to sometimes feel really sad and really broken. And I, you know, as in reading the first chapters of Ustada Yasmin, it's very important to be clear that when we say you've got to take um, these things out of your heart that hurt you, it doesn't mean that you need to stop loving the person or, um, you know, kind of put it completely aside. And so when you think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that, you know, when you get married, you have completed half of your deen, one needs to really reflect on that. What is meant in that? So if I am supposed to love you and I love you, how am I supposed to love you but not have you in the center of my heart, right? So if we were to take you out of the center and rightfully place Allah in the center, and if, this, if we are able to create relationships, we are always in the center of my heart and your heart, but we work together, love each other, that in a way that brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next time you have a difficulty, the next time you are faced with a, a problem, what, what should you do? Should you be calling that friend? Should you be wailing and just really be upset and be complaining? Or should you be returning to Allah and be saying, what can I do in the situation, Ya Rab? What do you want from me in the situation, Ya Rab? How can we ease the situation? SubhanAllah, when you do that, you will be amazed. If we are able to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to Allah, you will be amazed at how much calm is brought over you. If you were to sit with the Holy Quran in this most difficult and stressful situation, it cannot be explained, but there is a serenity that is attained when you do so. And when you experience that, and when you start experiencing that, you start training yourself into healing yourself from the difficulties of this world.
by constantly turning to Allah, by loving Allah, by turning to his kalam, by understanding his message, by understanding your purpose. If you shift your focus from something that you are doing, whether you're baking a cake, whether you're doing some numbers at the bank, if you shift your attention, what's going to happen? Quite possibly things are going to go wrong, right? Very similarly, when we shift our focus from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we give him the least of ourselves, when we make that salah in a hurry, when we skip that salah and think it's okay, when we decide, oh, okay, um, you know what, what's the time now? I have until um, uh, 4 or 14 before I can make um, my asr. What, are you, what do you think you are doing? What, where are the priorities shifting to? So we're wanting things to be perfect at home and we're wanting everyone to be healthy that we love, but we're compromising the most important, the most important one that should be centered in our heart that has gifted us with absolutely everything. So when we go from chapter to chapter from obvious mean mujahid the idea of this book is to not to look at it in isolation of each other so if we are identifying is this love that i'm feeling one has to take the step-by-step guidance of this very heart of mine what is in it where is allah in it have i given allah a portion of my heart or have i centered allah in my heart and am i loving everything through allah and is every relationship that I am engaging in for the sake of Allah, pleasure of Allah, and mostly is it bringing me closer to Allah? Because remember, our focus isn't for what's happening in this temporary room. It's like you're going to an airport and you're sitting in the airport and you're waiting for that flight, but you're making that airport your world. And that's currently what we're locked in doing. And we need to find new ways to unlock that so that we can take our ticket to Jannah, inshallah, and focus on the things here that will get us there, inshallah. Um, shukran, Taslima. And I think one very important thing that you also mentioned about um, Nikah specifically is that um, when we say that a complete half of your deen, Sometimes we don't think of it in the correct manner. And I think in connection to what you have mentioned is that by completing half of your deen, it is that you are making the intention to, in conjunction with this person, together with this person, enter into this contract of ibadah and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the ultimate goal. And the person should be there with you to aid you in attaining that closeness and strengthening that relationship inshallah so we will now move on with the next part of the reading with sister Suraya. this uh, third subtitle that we will be reading is entitled this is love and so there are some who spend their whole lives seeking sometimes giving sometimes taking sometimes chasing but often just waiting. They believe that love is a place that you get to, a destination at the end of a long road. The path of expectations and the falling in love with love is a painful one, but it can bring its own lessons. And the one who runs after a mirage never gets there, but keeps running. The type of perfection you seek cannot be found in the material world. It can only be found in God. That image of human love that you seek is an illusion in the desert of life. So if that is what you seek, you'll keep chasing. But no matter how close you get to a mirage, you never touch it. Yet you will give your whole life still to reaching this place. You do this because in the fairy tale, that's where the story ends. It ends at the finding, the joining, and the wedding. It is found at the oneness of two souls, and everyone around you will make you think that your path ends there. 
at the place where you meet your soulmate, your other half, at the point in the path where you get married. Then and only then they tell you will you ever finally be complete. This of course is a lie because completion cannot be found in anything other than God. Yet the lesson you've been taught since the time you were little, from every story, every song, every movie, every ad, every well-meaning auntie, is that you aren't complete otherwise. And if, God forbid, you are one of the outcasts who haven't gotten married or have been divorced, you are considered deficient or incomplete in some way. The lesson you're taught is that the story ends at the wedding and then that's where Jannah or paradise begins. That's when you'll be saved and completed and everything that was once broken will be fixed. That the only problem is that's not where the story ends. That's where it begins. That's where the building starts, the building of a life, the building of your character, the building of sabr, perseverance and sacrifice, the building of selflessness, the building of love. However, if the person you marry becomes your ultimate focus in life, your struggle has just begun. Now your spouse will become your greatest test. Until you remove that person from the place in your heart that only God should be, it will keep hurting. But once in a while, people enter your life that you love. Not for what they give you, but for what they are. The beauty you see in them is a reflection of the creator, so you love them. Now suddenly, it isn't about what you're getting, but rather what you can give. This is unselfish love. This second type of love is the rarest. So for all of those who have spent their life seeking, know that purity of anything is found at the source. And if it is love that you seek, seek it through God. Every other stream not based in his love poisons the one who drinks from it. And the drinker will continue to drink until the poison all but kills him. Once you begin to see everything beautiful as only a reflection of God's beauty, you will learn to love in the right way. For his sake, everything and everyone you love will be for, through, and because of him. This means you will love what he loves and not love what he does not love. And when you do love, you will give to the creation not for what you can get into return from them. You will love and you will give love, but you will be sufficed from him. And the one who is sufficed by God is the richest and the most generous of all lovers. Your love will be by him, for him and because of him. That is the liberation of the self from servitude to any created thing. And that is freedom. That is happiness. That is love. And that, Muslima, concludes the third section of our reading session. Shukran. Shukran, Sister Suraya. That is, that is very nice. And it reminded me of um, one of the, the levels of shukr, actually. And the highest level of shukr, especially with um, being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is khawasul khawas. And... Um, Umar radiallahu an describes this as when you when you see you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. You hear Allah in everything and when you act, Allah is in everything that you do. Also it's it's within all your five senses and it encompasses your entire life. And I think this is one of the one of the greatest examples of love as well. And to further this reflection will be Sister Taslima, inshallah. Okay, Bismillah. This is love. Well, I don't know if many of that is on years already married, but 
I would believe that at every stage of our lives, we do have an understanding of the affection of what that feeling is like and the meaning for it. And for those that are married and hopefully in love also with each other, the ability to understand love not being only that feeling of butterflies, that feeling of waiting for him to be home or that feeling of seeing each other across the room, the ability of completing each other's sentences, those moments of difficulty and making through it. But so much more tends to grow the love we have for each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in the Holy Quran, an obvious sign is that he created for you from yourselves, mates, that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs for people who give thought. Now, quite often we'll find that many marriages are tested and it's tested, I believe, because it's one of the biggest ibadahs there is. Marriage is an ibadah. It's, it's meant to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have been so blessed in so many ways of having the Holy Quran, of having our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the greatest keys and guidance to living the, our, our best lives. And of course, how to be in those different relationships. And if we were to reflect on our, our very beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his wives, we see and understand that love was deep and that there was love, there was romance. There's so many things in the history of our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's relationship with Sayyida Khadija, with Sayyida Aisha, may Allah be well pleased with them, that would really give us those moments where we'd go, oh, that is so absolutely beautiful and sweet and, and just absolutely amazing. And so it's very normal as human beings to seek that type of affection, seek love, seek that connection in our relationships, but also to seek Allah through those relationships together. And so when we even look at this very verse in terms of the affection and mercy between us, those very examples from our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have an understanding that while our greatest love, our heart is completely full with Allah, but Allah gives us these gifts. And Allah gives us those opportunities to also taste the sweetness of what love is in terms of each other to grow closer to him. But when I was going through this chapter, I also wanted to understand, so what is this love, this love for Allah? And I thought, alhamdulillah, if I was to think about my husband and how I would yearn to be in his company, how I'd want to tell him things. And in the earlier days, how you'd really want to know so much more about them and how their affection means so much more to you. If I truly love Allah and I say I love Allah, it should not just be coming from my lips. It should not just be coming from fulfilling, making my salah. It needs to be something so much deeper. It needs to have what we always would prefer with somebody we consider to, to love, and that would be quality time, making quality in everything that we do, in how we love Allah, in how we identify Allah's creation, in how we identify Allah's rahmah upon us, in how we identify our purpose and our actions in how we identify what choices we make. And that is very important, those choices that we make. Sometimes those choices are pressured out of what we worry about, whether we worry whether people approve of things or not. And quite often those choices are made because we fear, and we fear the creation and not the creator. And so we tend to neglect whom we should love. And if I was to ask, the question that if 
my husband chose things that would make it obvious that he neglects my importance in his life that would certainly break my heart but most certainly it would bring up a very big question does he really love me and so when we reflect upon our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we need to reflect on the quality of love that we are giving Allah owns our heart. Allah has created us to worship him. But Allah has also given us and, and placed tests upon our path along with growing our closeness to him. Well, Allah loves us so much. He wants us to turn to him. He wants us to speak to him. He wants us to return to him all the time. And so it's also very important in identifying ways that you can be returning to him. How would you be able to identify growing your closeness to Allah in your very actions, in your very desires, in your very wants? And so it is a journey because we have been left and gone astray for quite a while. And it takes work to now start unpacking, unpacking how much of this love that we love is not love, and to shift it into centering ourselves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we are wanting a better marriage, if we are wanting things to be better, it cannot be better unless we are turning to Allah. Unless we are submitting to him, unless we are understanding that nothing happens but by Allah, unless we are accepting that it will only be what Allah wills that will be, and that Allah is all knowing. So until we are able to completely submit our hearts, our root, our body, every part of us, without anything or anyone else, like our pure submission to Allah, we are not going to attain that true growth and that true essence and that closeness to Allah. As long as there is something between you, as long as you are turning and saying, no, 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 I need to cook first, or no, 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 I need to do this first, or no, 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 this is more important, you are leading yourself astray. You are imprisoning yourself. You are being that slave to the dunya. And so it takes big decisions, it takes hard work. And over this week, so we're definitely working together, inshallah. And we will on and we'll find ourselves still, still moving between that because we will be tested insistently and consistently until we are able to cleanse ourselves, cleanse our minds, cleanse our hearts, and place Allah truly where Allah should be in the center of our hearts and loving our true purpose. Shukran so much, Taslima. That reflection really makes you think about, you know, if you really putting Allah at the center of your life and even with the smallest things, sometimes we think we have so much time, but then we run out of it so fast and we don't realize how much of our time we are dedicating to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it should actually be reversed. And we will now move on to the last reading segment with Sister Suraya, inshallah. Shukran Muslima. The final segment is titled, Fall in Love with the Real Thing. It is never easy to let go, or is it? Most of us would agree that there are few things harder than letting go of what we love. And yet, sometimes that's exactly what we have to do. Sometimes we love things that we can't have. Sometimes we want things that are not good for us. And sometimes we love what Allah does not love. To let go of these things is hard. Giving up something the heart adores is one of the hardest battles we ever have to fight. As humans, we don't deal well with emptiness. An empty space must be filled immediately. The pain of emptiness is too strong. It compels the victim to fill that space. A single moment with an empty spot causes excruciating pain. 
That's why we run from distraction to distraction and from attachment to attachment. We get addicted to things and can't seem to let them go, even when they hurt us, even when they damage our lives and our bond with God, even when they are so unhealthy for us. They fill something inside that we think we need, that we think we cannot live without. Why does that happen? Why do we have so much trouble sacrificing what we love for what God loves? Why can't we just let go of things? I think we struggle so much with letting go of what we love because we haven't found something we love more to replace it. When a child falls in love with the toy car, he becomes consumed with that love. But what if he can't have the car? What if he has to walk by the store every day and see the toy he can't have? Every time he walks by, he would feel pain. We want love. We want money. We want status. We want this life. And like that child, we too become consumed with these loves. So then when we can't have those things, we are that child in a store struggling not to steal them. We are the stumbling servant struggling to let go of the toy because it's all we see. We don't see the real thing, the real version, the real model. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what is the life of this world but amusement and play? But verily, the home is the year after. That is life indeed, if they but knew. Quran 29, 64. If we could see the real thing, we could get over our deep love for the lesser fake model. In another ayah, God says, but you prefer the worldly life, while the year after is better and more enduring. Quran 87, 16, 17. This is not to say that we cannot have or even love things of this life. As believers, we are told to ask for good in this life and in the next. We understand fully that there is a lesser model or dunya, meaning lower, and there is the real model the year after. But how does that realization help us in this life? It helps because it makes the struggle to follow the halal and refrain from the haram easier. The more we can see the real thing, the easier it becomes to give up the unreal when necessary. For example, many of the Prophet ﷺ companions had wealth, but when the time came, they could easily give half or all of it for Allah's sake. Seeing the real thing transforms the way we love Ibn Taymiyyah radiallahu anhu discussed this concept when he said, if your heart is enslaved by someone who is forbidden for him, one of the main causes for this miserable situation is turning away from Allah. For once the heart has tasted worship of Allah and sincerity towards him, nothing will be sweeter to it than that. Nothing will be more delightful or more precious. No one leaves his beloved except for another one he loves more and for fear of something else. The heart will give up corrupt love in favor of true love or for fear of them. When the love of God, his messenger, and the home with him is really seen, it overpowers and dominates any other love in the heart. The more that love is seen, the more dominant it becomes, and thereby the easier it will be to really actualize the statement of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Say indeed, my prayer, my service of sacrifice, my living and my dying are for Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Quran 6, 162. Shukran Muslima. Shukran to Sisreya, that was a very beautiful reading. I can't believe it's actually the end, almost the end of this. 
So we will continue to the last reflection with Sister Taslima, inshallah. Inshallah. Listening to Sister Sudea, all I could think of was Hasbunallah wa nahmukil. For indeed, Allah is sufficient for us. And I was just reflecting on this very relationship, you know, whether it's with your loved one, your spouse, or whether it's with a family member, how do we build it in a way that hurts less perhaps? And is that even possible? And then I'm reminded by the very fact that if we reflected on the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if we looked on his journey, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we'll understand that he loved deeply. We'll understand that our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam felt pain. We'll understand that our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through the worst humiliation and that all he wanted to do was to love, to extend the message of truth. And quite often, many of us find us, ourselves in that position where we love and we love sincerely, but we are rejected with so much of insult and pain by the things and those we love most, and it is painful to the depth of it. And when that pain happens, it breaks you in so many ways, because we are so, when we love, we love big and we love deep and we take all our energy and we invest it into what we love. And so when that, when we are, not reciprocated, when we do not receive the same back, when we are in doubt that we are loved the same way, it's so, so painful. And if we were to think if there was or is a perfect love, it would be Allah's love indeed. And if we were to try and understand that that very person whom we love, be it our spouse or our child, and we, we see it so often, even with parents and kids, you'll find that our mothers, even our fathers do so much. They sacrifice immensely. And there is this unfortunate, very sad return of a lack of appreciation in some ways. And it's not necessarily about poor breeding, it's also not necessarily about not teaching about appreciation, but it is that very nature that we are not perfect and that we do not love perfectly either. But Allah's love is. And if we were to seek the perfect love, the love that does not hurt us, the love that is meant for us, it is seeking the love of Allah. And Allah loves us irrespective of whether we obey him or disobey him, whether we are meeting him five times a day or not. And I think of being in love and if you have a meeting with your loved one, which is of course in the halal sense of it, that you would not miss that meeting, that you would not miss being in their company. And most of all, that you desire that love to be perfect and forever. And the beauty of it is that our very beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that you will be with the one whom you love. And I pray sincerely that we will be reunited in the circles of those we love. But to be able and be entitled to that type of love and that gift it would mean loving the way you are meant to love. And that is placing your entire heart and taking it and filling it with Allah and understanding your purpose with the gifts that he has blessed you with. So if Allah has blessed you with a spouse, it's not 
he hasn't only blessed you so that this man can care for you and love you and cherish you and make you feel like a princess 24 7 and our brothers not to make you feel like a king 24 7 but there's a bigger purpose there's a bigger purpose in bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the things that are happening in your life at that time. And if you are not acting as reminders to each other, and I don't mean standing with the Quran and giving quotes to each other on a daily basis, beloved, that's how we love, that is just going to cause more problems. What I am thinking about is just really, really lo loving and understanding Allah's love and really taking it and imbibing it and understanding that if Allah is talking about love and mercy between us, then you need to, you need to take a step back and first understand what love is, understand how Allah loves us, understand the love of our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you're not educating yourself in understanding that purpose and, and how to love, then you're not going to be loving correctly. You're going to be loving the way days of our lives have showed us. You're going to love, be loving the way um, they are showing us in Begu Sudai. You're going to be loving the way Cinderella said she got loved. And you're not going to be loving the way we are actually made to love. And that is the depth of our hearts. This entire, I, I don't think if we could possibly measure love in a sense that we'd be able to say, okay, Muslim, I'm going to love you so much today, okay? And today I'll give you so much, okay? Because we have been created a certain way. But it's also to reflect on the other emotions that you place in your heart in terms of love and mercy. And so you need need to be reflecting and finding Allah. If you're not finding Allah, then you are lost. And we don't want to be lost because we're running short of time, subhanAllah. It's like life is all but a minute, they say. And this minute needs to be well spent. And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to his love, to all of those who bring us closest to his love and to all the actions and activities that bring us closest to his love. I look forward to being back in your company, inshallah, in two weeks' time. But I also would like to say, please take this time to reflect. Reflect on what is keeping you chained. You reflect on what is enslaving you. And it doesn't mean we don't get to have a life and enjoy ourselves. It's about having that life and enjoying it through the love of Allah, through our gratitude for Allah and getting closer to him. Shukran. Shukran so much, Taslima. And also moving on, we can we can definitely relate to um at Tunya Sijinul Mu'min. And that is that the this life for this dunya is like a jail for for the believers. And when sometimes we locked within this hole almost of our nafs, we can really we can really see that reality coming to life. And inshallah, just a reminder that next week we will not be having a session due to Eid. And the Medina Institute and everyone from the enrichment team and Sister Salima and Sister Zuraya would like to wish everyone an Eid Mubarak in advance, inshallah. And we wish you have a happy day. Um, social distancing very important from everyone and just trying to have a lot of sober in this very difficult time that we see ourselves in and if we center our love as sister Taslima mentioned uh, around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it will become easier for us inshallah also a reminder that if anyone would like to purchase or download the book um, the information is all in the whatsapp group and Anytime when you want to download it or buy it, whatever it might be, you may access it in there. And we look forward to seeing each, each and every one on the 27th of July, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.